Welcome back to a very special edition of From the Bridge. Today we're going to talk about race in America, race in sports, and ways to wrap ourselves around working through our differences and celebrating our similarities. We're also going to talk about the rights of student athletes. This is a very interesting week where a number of college football players have gotten together and and basically exercise their rights to have a voice. They've said, hey, it's our season and we want to play. My guest angler is Ernie Kent, my friend and a role model for everything good about college athletics and good about America. Ernie's perspective on the black athlete experience and the student athlete experience will be profound. I'll be back up on the soapbox and yes, we'll still find time for another place to eat on the road with Rick. We're traveling in stormy waters today, but I know there is a calm and peace and joy in a safe harbor around the corner. Race. Now that's a four-letter word. To understand, you must be both understood and equally eager to give others the same right to be understood. (laughs) That's pretty easy to say, but it seems to be damn hard to do. You know, we're all flawed human beings. We're part biology, which we call nature, and we're part environment, which we call nurture. Y'all know I I talk about Jimmy Buffett a lot, uh, but, you know, one of Jimmy Buffett's side men is a guy named Mac McAnally. Mac McAnally is a great country music musician. He's been the... Country music, uh, side musician of the year a number of times and all that. Well, Mac wrote a song a few years ago called Back Where I Come From. And it's interesting. Uh, I think it starts with our perspective on life, back where I come from. There's a lot of things you can control in your life, but here's two essential things you cannot control. Number one, you couldn't control who your parents were. And you couldn't control where you were born. I was blessed with two things. I was born a white male in the 1950s in the American South. More importantly, I was born to two parents who taught me to value people, all people. My parents would always say that no one was better than us, but also we were no better than anybody else. Maybe more blessed, but not better. My mother's father killed himself when she was two years old and uh, left uh, my grandmother, Hattie Kennedy, a widow, three little girls. And there was the story that she would always take her little girls to church and they would all wear white gloves. And they would say, who does Hattie Kennedy think she is with these little girls wearing white gloves? Well, my mama would say we were poor, and I mean really poor, but we weren't common. I think my mama said the worst thing you could be in life was to be common. I grew up in the Baptist church. You know, a segregated church, yes. You know, Sunday morning today may still be the most segregated part of the week, which is really a shame because we all worship the same God. But I remember as a child being taught a hymn. That hymn said, Jesus loves the little children All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. We were taught and expected to live this. I've held a lot of babies. I'm a a baby guy. People that know me know babies like me. They smile at me. they, They coo at me. I like babies. And I've held babies of every race and nationality around the world. And here's what I know. Babies are not born to hate or to feel better about anyone else. That has to be taught. The good news, because of my parents, I was taught to do neither. Now, make no mistake about it, it was the Jim Crow era. I grew up in the South in the 50s and 60s. I went to all white schools. The only black people I knew were the ladies that came and cleaned our house, the maids. But I thought they were part of our family. Uh, you know, we had we had maids that that just were like another relative, I thought. Um, but then in 1968, 
we finally got around in Atlanta to integrating the schools. There was the all-black school, Hamilton High School, and my high school, Avondale High School. And I never forget that. I was a ninth grader. And right in the middle of the year, we integrated the school. And a whole bunch of my friends fled. They fled to private schools. Their parents took them out of school. Well, I didn't. My parents said, no, of course, we're not going to go to another school. And of course, we're going to be peaceful. And of course, we're going to be accepting. I grew up in Atlanta that at that time had a tagline during a very, very difficult time in America during the civil rights movement. Atlanta coined the phrase that they were a city too busy to hate. I went to DeKalb County schools, which at that time were very top rated nationally. And somehow it worked. And let me tell you, sports helped. There was a quarterback at Hamilton High School that was an outstanding black athlete. Of course, he came to our high school, and the problem was our head football coach's son was the quarterback. And so they moved this great quarterback to wide receiver where it worked out. His name was Danny Bugs. He later played at West Virginia and later for the Washington Redskins. And so the merger of both black and white athletes just made us all better. It made us brothers. And then in the middle of my uh, now sophomore year in high school, we moved to Overland Park, Kansas. We moved in January of 1970. And I remember going to Shawnee Mission South. It was a brand new school. Listen, it had 3,000 students with only three grades. It was like going to a college campus. But guess what? 3,000 students, one black. One black. His father was a neurosurgeon. (laughs) And so, but it was interesting because I was from the South. Here I had moved to the Midwest. And because of the fact that I was from the South, I was accused by association of being a racist. And nothing could have been farther from the truth. I moved back to Atlanta for my senior year. In my senior year, I played on a high school basketball team that there were three white guys. I was one of them and five black guys on the basketball team. I had a car. No, no, I don't say I was big and entitled. I had an old 1963 Belvedere Plymouth push-button automatic, um, but I had a car. And we would practice into the early evening, and then I would drive all my black teammates home every night. Now, let me repeat the math. We had nine guys. So me and nine other guys squeezed into a Belvedere Plymouth every night, and, and I'd drive them home. And they, they would all laugh at me because I knew all the words to all the R&B songs. I loved rhythm and blues, and I knew the words to the R&B songs of that era. And so many of my black teammates were like, dude, you're, you're blacker than we are. Um, And then I went off to college and played with other black athletes. And then I worked in high school and college sports and then in the sports marketing industry. So on one hand, it's easy for me to pat myself on the back this morning for not being a racist. Now, I do know this. My two children are completely colorblind, and I'm very proud of them for that. But I now realize at age 66 that I'm still missing something. And what I really was and still am missing is context. I'm still a white man with all the privileges that come from that. I do not know what it was like or what it is to be black in America. I have played with, coached with, and worked with black Americans, but I need to know more because something is not working in America. So today, I am now trying to understand more and be understood a little less. Without understanding, there can be no learning, no changing, no progress. I've brought my dear friend, Ernie Kent, to the program today so that we can have a meaningful conversation about race and what it really means to be black in America. I hope today's show will enrich you. Ernie Kent is an American treasure. 
Ernie played for Dick Harder at Oregon and was an assistant coach at both Colorado State and Stanford before becoming the head coach at St. Mary's and then at his alma mater, Oregon, taking the Ducks to two Elite Eight games in the NCAA tournament. He later coached again at Washington State. Ernie and I became great friends while he and I both served on the NABC board, that's the National Association of Basketball Coaches, and later Ernie even worked for a while at Fishbait in between coaching jobs. Ernie has also done color commentary for the Pac-12 Conference and for Fox Sports. But forget the accolades and the accomplishments. Ernie is simply one of the best people I know and a man who has changed lives, both black and white lives, everywhere he's been. Let's welcome my dear friend Ernie Kent to the bridge. Ernie, good morning. Thanks for being with us today. Rick, it's my pleasure. Well, I want to start at the beginning because I think that's where we uh, we we begin to better understand people, where, where they come from. I know you were born in, in Rockford, Illinois. T- tell me about growing up there. I mean, you, you're, you're one year younger than me, uh, so you grew up in... In a in an era really before the civil rights movement, what was it like in um, in in Rockford? Rockford was an interesting place because uh, at the time there was employment, uh, healthy environment. There's been several years um, past that I've heard it's one one of the worst places uh, to live in the country, maybe the worst city. I just don't quite understand that. But but I'm one of ten kids where parents came up from the South, Mississippi, Tennessee, uh, to make a better life. And we lived in a, a two bedroom house with the 10 of us there, seven boys and three girls. My mom had seven straight boys. So you can just imagine, uh, how interesting God that bl- was. To have God that bless her. In that small of a house. <laughs> God exactly. bless her. I, I, I figured she had 10, she had 10 kids by the age of 34, all by the same man, even, which is amazing in itself too. But Rockford was, um, uh, it was interesting times just because, um, you know, you were around through part of the civil rights movement. And in fact, my older brother uh, was a Black Panther Party member, one of the original ones that established it uh, in Rockford, Illinois. And I can remember uh, as, as a young man uh, going to some of those meetings with him in Chicago and having to stay down in the basement uh, while they attended the meetings uh, up above because of uh, of being a, a quote unquote becoming of age, being a basketball player, being uh, somewhat of a celebrity basketball player, he didn't want me involved uh, in terms of the activities that possibly could happen. So he kept me out of harm's way. But uh, it was interesting because without having parents around and, and working so hard to make two ends meet uh, as young kids, uh, we really literally kind of raised ourselves, even though uh, they required everybody to work some sort of job. I don't care if it's shoveling snow, delivering papers, whatever it is, you have to work. So they did teach you how hard you had to work uh, to be successful. But literally, I never saw mom and dad a lot. I saw all of my older brothers and, and younger sisters as we grew up and, and, and went through life and everything. And I remember uh, just the energy that was in that city uh, when Dr. King was shot and and the rioting that's kind of broke out. Even in, I was in junior high school at the time and understanding that and, and how the, it intensified even more so um, the fear, uh, the, the threat of, of being stopped by police officers and all those things, particularly when on the front page of the paper, it could be Willie Kent, who changed his name to as Monko Tiba. And then on the sports section, there's Ernie Kent, the All-American. So you can understand the, the difference that I had to deal with in terms of the dynamics of all those things. So uh, it was interesting times for me, but yet I always knew uh, to better myself, I needed to leave and, and needed to really uh, strengthen myself in terms of finding out what more was going on uh, in our country and even more so in the world. Did your parents, uh, uh, you know, I'm assuming that your parents were part of the what I call the, the great migration north out of the out of the south into the industrial Midwest. And I assume they neither one of them had gone to college, correct? Correct. It's, and so what what made you and your siblings believe y'all could go to college? Where, where was that instilled in y'all? 
I, I think uh, dad had like a eighth grade education and my mom had a sixth grade education and they both worked in factories. Uh, my mom worked on an assembly line for 26 years and, and missed maybe one day. So again, you're looking at two parents, dad had five jobs and you saw how hard they worked. And I was the first one, I'm the sixth of seven boys uh, that actually went to your college. I had a brother went to a community college. So I was the first one that got away and really use sports to do that. And in those environments, that was a big deal to us to, to use sports. And that was your out. That was your way of, of getting out of the hood. That was your way of, of going and seeing the world. And, and then eventually uh, I ended up reaching back and bringing my two sisters and a younger brother with me. And what's amazing is that uh, they all are extremely successful having the opportunity to branch out from Rockford and see the country, see the world. And it was one of the first times uh, I understood that uh, success breeds success. That if you can take people uh, that are spiritually sounded, um, want to be successful, want to make it, and put them in healthy, successful environments, then that energy of that environment will pull them along and give them the opportunity to be successful too because they're driven, they're intelligent enough, they're motivated enough, they just need an opportunity. You know, and it's interesting. Today, yeah, it's interesting about the power of influence. Um, you know, obviously, you went and had a good enough experience that you said to your siblings, "You need to do this. You, you need to get out and do that." I had Mike Polisi on last week, and uh, and Mike said he grew up in a little small town on the Jersey Shore, but he had a prof- He had a high school teacher that had gone to Purdue. <laughs> And, and he was so influential that Mike went to Purdue, and he said, nine other guys in my little class, well, we all went to Purdue from New Jersey. Yeah. And so it is the power of influence. Well, it's the power of influence, Rick, but I remember I, I had a van, and I drove from Eugene, Oregon, straight through to Rockford, Illinois. That was 30-something hours. And grabbed my sister and put her in the van, so you are coming with me. That's how bad it was. Um, the environments that they were they were growing up in, and then we we went back and got my uh, another sister, and my brother came out. So th- you can call it influence. We can also call it they didn't have a choice. Well, there's there's different kinds of influence. I think sometimes a little tough love is a good thing. Now, Ernie, you were an all American in a city in Chicago, Illinois, and probably had a chance to go to any number of universities. Why Oregon? Well, a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, Rockford had become so tough in terms of environment to survive and maneuver in that I felt like there was a pull to get away, and Oregon was as far as I could go. <laughs> in, in the water and going to Hawaii. And then, uh, secondly, having never been north, excuse me, west of the Mississippi, uh, it was the first time I had seen the mountains, uh, the ocean, and, and I'll never forget coming out to Oregon, and at the time, could go off campus further than 30 miles and the river guide had me in the McKenzie river and scooped up the river water said here drink this and i'm like dad they drink the river water out here so uh, i fell in love with oregon the northwest the mountains the ocean and eventually even named my my daughter McKenzie because of my love for oregon you know what did you find when you get got there was was the culture a good culture. I know. I know. When when I visited with you uh, in in Eugene, um, you introduced me to a family that kind of adopted you guys. To t- talk about what you found there. You know, it was a it was a great culture because you instantly uh, felt a lot safer in some regards. Um, it was a culture where people were really friendly, particularly if if you were college athletes, and at the time you could have a home away from home, and and people did bring you in, and it was the first time. Uh, the families that I was involved with that I had a chance to sit at a dinner table because with 10 kids, we didn't sit at the dinner table. We ate in shifts. You got your beans and got out the door. But sitting at the dinner table, you started to see now what corporate America looked like, being around those families and just the things they talked about and how organized they were and their approach to dinners at this time. Here's our conversation. Then we sit and talk more. It was fascinating to me. But at the same time, it was a big adjustment. Any college student athlete that steps foot on a campus coming out of an inner city environment to me they are already successful the fact that they, the fact that they step foot on that campus because of what they've gone through to get there and then once you're there i literally had to change how i dressed 
uh, the food I ate, how I spoke, because the environment doesn't adapt to you. You have to adapt to the environment as a student athlete. And that was probably one of the biggest things that I think that allowed me to be successful is understanding that at a young age. I remember when Charlotte and I came out and, and, and visited you at, at Washington State and and we laughed. You know, we, we flew into Spokane and we drove and it was just miles and miles of white, of, of snow, blinding snow to Pullman. And, and when we got down there and we, we talked and, and, and you said, you know, Rick, we don't even have a black barber shop in Pullman. And, and, and I think about the cultural change, you know, that, 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 that piece of culture is so important in the African-American community. And so you, you literally do pull kids out. It's almost like going to a foreign country, isn't it? I mean, it, it's so different. Well, it, it, it is different. And I remember in recruiting, a lot of my questions that came my way from parents were, the academic piece and all of that and, and your support and tutoring. And one of the questions I would put at the recruits was, do you cut hair? <laughs> because we, <laughs> you were literally recruiting barbers as well as basketball players because <laughs> you didn't have them in your community. <laughs> but well, uh, it was like a, a, a foreign country because so many things were foreign to you that you never had an opportunity to experience and grow up with. Uh, as a young man and you were seeing and experiencing for the first time, but it was also what I would call an education within an education. You were getting educated by the University of Oregon, but you were also getting educated by corporate Eugene, Oregon. And you could learn so much in terms of how to present, articulate, understand. And at the same time, there was the book education they were getting that was taking place in the classroom as well. Well, it sounded like you you were a sponge for change. I mean, you were saying there's, there's a big world out there. There's a lot of new things for me. And you took advantage of everything, every possibility that you could from the collegiate experience. And I, I believe that's, you know, a, a big part. I've always said that, you know, probably 90% of what you learn in college, you didn't learn in the classroom. <laughs> you learn, you learn somewhere else. Um, you, you played on some great teams and, and you still have you know, one of the things that I like and admire about you is you still have great relationships with your teammates. Um, talk talk about the teams there. You know, growing up in Rockford, it, it prepared for you for the challenges of, of Eugene. And then when you got to Eugene, uh, Dick Harder was their basketball coach. And Dick was a Marine, ex-Marine drill sergeant. Very, very similar. He coached the same way Bobby Knight would. Mm-hmm. And again, uh, there was a lot of, of fear in those environments because you'd never been around somebody with that tough of a mentality trying to get you to do what you needed to do for them to be successful and at the same time make you successful. So in those types of environment, you really rally and come together uh, with your teammates. And I, it was one of the, the first times also that I saw uh, in an environment where black and white really came together because you had to come together uh, to survive uh, practices. You had to come together to be successful on the floor. And that's one of the, to me, one of the beauties of athletics because it, it strips away some of, not all of, but some of the prejudices because in that locker room, you do have to bi- bound together and get to know your teammates in order to be successful. And that's why we're such great teammates even today because of those relationships. I, I tend to be an amateur sports uh, sociologist, and I, I have watched and, and read a lot about um, the great immigrant migration uh, at the turn of the last century and, and how sport became the connecting tissue. You know, it didn't matter if you were Italian or Irish or German or Norwegian or whatever. It was, if you stepped across the lines, could you play? Unfortunately, African-Americans were left out of that conversation in that era. And it wasn't until, obviously, Jackie Robinson and later that that we began to realize that. I, I said earlier on the show today that we actually integrated my high school in Atlanta, Georgia, in 1968, the year Dr. King got assassinated. And and we didn't miss a beat because we were all jocks. And and, and the, the, the black athletes that came from Hamilton High School to Avondale High School just made us a whole lot better. And we wanted to win. And, and I think sport was a, a change agent uh, in, in a lot of ways. So you go have this great experience at Oregon. What made you want to coach? I thought I was a, a, a really good basketball player. I was in love with the game. Uh, 
was very smart. I understood how to play the game. Uh, so my game says yes, but my body said no, because I, I had knee problems that didn't allow me to further my career past Oregon. And I always wanted to stay involved with the game because I loved it so much. And I, I specifically remember sitting around one day, so you know what, I can't play, so I'm going to coach. And had an opportunity to, to start out in some uh, junior high school environments and then later uh, with Oregon coaching the junior varsity team. And then from that, you run a, a staff with Jim Haney for a short period of time. And then the NCAA stepped in and cut back on the number of assistant coaches that you could have on your staff. And I was low man on the total pole. And this is back in like 79. And you lost your job. And I wanted to coach so bad, there were no opportunities because the numbers game was being played now, not a lot of openings in that. And I still wanted to coach. And I ran into a gentleman that was looking for a coach in to take to Saudi Arabia. And he wanted me to put him in contact with, with George Raveling, who was at Washington State at the time, or Jack Ramsey, who was with the Trailblazers. And I said, I don't, I don't care how much money you pay those guys. They're not going to leave their job to come to Saudi Arabia. But uh, I need a job. I'd be willing to try it. And, you know, we negotiated for about two or three days. And a, a seven-day window, uh, I went from being unemployed to on a plane uh, flying to Dahran, Saudi Arabia, uh, to coach in Sehat, Saudi Arabia. And I'll never forget that because it, it, it was a big decision, but it's a decision also to change my life. Well, a couple things. One, number one, y y you were denied the chance to continue as a college coach because someone at the NCA decided there were too many coaches. And so it, we see, I've seen a trend over my career, and you have too, of, of the NCA maybe having um, – thought they had uh, good intentions, but there are unintended consequences that ultimately deny people a chance to be successful. And now, because of that, you're, you're plunged into what obviously was a totally unique culture for you. Well, uh, speaking on NCAA, they, what, they, what happens is you deny entry-level opportunities. And if you want to coach at this level and there's no chance to get on any staff, even in a a, a, a lower level position, you lose opportunities. I can just think of the number of great coaches that didn't get opportunities because they couldn't find jobs. And that's kind of what goes on today a little bit. But, but for me going to um, Saudi Arabia in, in an environment where all three of my kids were born overseas and you're in a Shiite Muslim village, my first uh, couple of years there where my, my wife and I at the time were the only Americans uh, in that city. And which was fascinating because it literally forced you to restructure the way you thought again, what you eat, how you act. If you can imagine being in a, in a Muslim environment, coaching a team that prayer time would hit and you would have to give them opportunities to go over and, and wash hands and feet and pray. And even if it's halftime of a basketball game with about six, 7,000 men only in the arena and my wife, uh, halftime would hit and same thing, prayer time hit. So, I was, you became fascinating by the discipline of the religion. And obviously you can learn so much being in that type of environment. And yet at the same time, it was one of the safest environments I was in because of the fact you were there instructing their people. They literally treated you like royalty. It was pretty, pretty neat awakening and, and an environment to grow and go through. I think it really strengthened me as a person and as a man going through it. You know, it's interesting. We're 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 going to get into this in a minute, but we're, this this show today, we're talking a lot about race. But that culture, <clears throat> in a lot of ways, seems to be very demeaning towards women, uh, and 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 the lack of um, opportunities for women. Did y'all did did y'all find that? You know, Rick, uh, we were there for seven years in Saudi Arabia, and and two of them again in a Shiite Muslim village. They're Shiites and they're Sunnis, and uh, the family that I worked for, the gentleman's dad, had founded the Shiite religion uh, in, in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia. And when you're there, you understand the culture. And the way I understood it is uh, the, the wearing of the veil and all of that was to protect the women, protect the beauty from many, many years ago uh, of, of, of tribes coming over and, and raiding and, 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 and all of those things that took place. So... When you're there and you hear somebody, and I, I really got the chance to know my assistant coaches, and they would bring their wives over, and it was great because it was like reading a huge history book, and their thought process on it was, uh, why uh, should I should I drive and have an accident and get out and argue with a strange man when I can have a driver drive me around? Why? They've changed 
and those things now, but it wasn't a, it was us in the way we looked at their culture that we judged and said, this isn't right, where uh, they would look at our culture and judge some things too that they said weren't right as well too. Yeah, now, a lot of that has changed in this day and age because I think uh, women have demanded more, but uh, at the time we were there, it was fascinating just to get to know the culture because you were literally reading a huge history book and living it right in the middle of it. So how'd you get back? How'd you get back to the, to the collegiate you know, I was space? There seven years and, and I had a pretty good grasp for the, the language and everything and understanding and, and knowing that you had to be successful over there to be successful here. And I just felt like it was time to get back to, to the United States and coach. So everybody that recruited me and it was literally everybody in the country, I probably sent out 60, 70 uh, different resumes to Mike Krzyzewski, John Wooden, Bobby Knight, Digger Feltz, uh, anybody who was, was in my living room or reached out to me. And I was just amazed uh, at the number of people, Nolan Richardson, Roy Williams, that all wrote back and said to get into coaching, you need to come back to the States. You need to be at the Final Four, get to know people, work camps and those things. So people question our sanity for going over because you went over to this foreign country and then have three kids over there. But then once you were there working for the Arabian American Oil Company, my job switched to, they questioned our sanity for leaving. Why would you leave this environment uh, with the income and all of those things? But I wanted to coach college basketball. And, and seven years later, uh, I come back and chase around Boyd Grant at, at Colorado State. And he really gave me a great opportunity because it's difficult to step out of this profession for seven years and have the opportunity to come back and, and get a job with a coach of that stature at Colorado State. It's interesting you mentioned Colorado State because this week there's huge issues at Colorado State of, about accused racism uh, in their football program. And um, it's interesting somebody's accused – the coach would be an insensitive to uh, the COVID testing, but there was also some questions of racism that came out of the last football coach. But then I saw this morning where, you know, like 50 of the athletes, both black and white, have said, oh, no, 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 you're wrong. There's not been any racism here at Colorado State. But you went from Colorado State. How would you get with Mike Montgomery at uh, Stanford? Boyd and uh, myself and Tim Jankovic was on that staff. Wow. Well, too, was at SMU yep. right yep. now. Yep. Uh, Fred Litzenberger was on that staff, Sylvia Dominguez. And, you know, in the two years we were there, that first year we had to bring in nine recruits because the program was, was kind of in shambles. And, and we won their first ever Western Athletic Conference championship in the history of that school and ended up playing against Dwayne Census and Norm Sloan in the NCAA tournament. And then Mike Montgomery uh, lost his assistant. Uh, I believe it was Trent Johnson who took a head coaching job. And I, Mike knew Boyd. My, Mike had saw me recruiting during the summer and all those things and gave me an opportunity to come to Stanford. So after two being gone for seven years, I'm at Colorado State for two years. And then Mike hires me at Stanford. And, and that was huge because uh, now the prestige of Stanford, uh, Boyd was a, a great coach to get reacclimated to stateside coaching from a defensive offensive perspective. Mike was a great coach from an offensive defensive perspective. So those are two really good guys to come back and work under and really relearn the game stateside versus what was going on in Saudi Arabia. And so after being an assistant at Stanford, that's when you got the St. Mary's job, right? Correct. Uh, being in the Bay area uh, and being around St. Mary's, they needed a coach and uh, athletic director reached out to me about halfway uh, through our, my second season at Stanford and, and said, we would like to talk to you and, uh, that relationship started to cultivate, and we won the NIT championship in my second year at Stanford. And lo and behold, seven years out of the country, four years back, and now you're a head coach at St. Mary's College in Moraga, California. And you were at, how long were you at St. Mary's? I spent uh, uh, six seasons at St. Mary's, and and again, tremendous group of coaches and guys uh, that I was able to recruit there. Some just some outstanding guys that are all still in contact with each other and you to show you again about the, the bonds and, and the relationships you, you, you form in athletics. And uh, six years there, we, we won the, um, that last year, the Western uh, West Coast Conference Championship, Conference Championship, BYU Championship, and Hawaii Championship. And I always wanted to come back to Oregon. And sure enough, Mama called. Bill Moose reached yep, out yep. and I had a chance to come back home. 
And uh, and so you come back, and, and you had great success there. You had great teams. You took two teams to the Elite Eight, um, which is, you know, hey, <laughs> that's hard. People don't realize how, how, how many good teams there are and how, you know, tough the tournament is and, and the ability to advance. But you had – you just had a, an amazing – career there what was it like to go back it was like uh when you walked across that stage as a student athlete i remember telling the teammate i'm going to come back here and coach one day and then you have to get yourself ready and position yourself for that so you graduated in in 1977 and they hired you in 1997 so i tell student athletes this all the time it took me 20 years to get back to Oregon and have an opportunity to become the head coach and was literally named the first African-American head coach in the history of the school, which has just blew me away. That in that great tradition of Ahmad Rashad that played there, some of those great football players that came through Oregon and, and the Ronnie Lees and some of those great Stan Love Stan and all those great basketball players that came through, to hear you were given this opportunity by Bill Moose who's my good friend today, uh, to coach there. So it was a big deal to me, very emotional deal uh, to finally make it back and somebody look at you and say, you are a product of the University of Oregon. You have traveled the world. You've worked for an oil company. You've coached overseas. You've groomed yourself for 20 years. If you cannot hire a product of your university, that does not speak highly of your university to me. And when Bill gave me that opportunity, it gave you a chance to reinvigorate Oregon because not only did you sell the opportunity to want to be successful, you could sell the emotional aspects of being successful, having been there as a student athlete. So it, it was really a great marriage to come together uh, from where I was in my lifetime and where the University of Oregon was headed and where they needed a new coach, and here I was. You know, we we see that so many black coaches, in my opinion, take bad jobs because they have to. Mm. And and then and then it, it, it gets out, well, the guy can't coach. Oh, no, look, I mean, bad jobs are bad jobs. I don't care if you're black, white, or green. Um, and, and, and that's a, a situation. And I think we find ourselves, even today, where black coaches just don't get opportunities at great programs. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree with that? You know, you're, you're, you're spot on, but yet you have to take those jobs. I remember uh, when, a, when the St. Mary's job opened up, you know, we had a, obviously a really good program at Stanford with a, with a great coach and Mike and, and Adam Keefe was just graduated. And Mike, I remember Mike telling me, don't take the St. Mary's job. It's a bad job. You can, we can find you a better job. And I told him, Mike, I have to take the St. Mary's job because I have to show Oregon I can coach, which is ultimately where I want it to be. And St. Mary's was a was a bad job walking in the door that we turned into a, a great job. And, and Randy Bennett has taken it to a level sooner. But you're, you're absolutely right. We're, we're not given the same opportunities uh, in the intro sometimes. So we have to take those jobs, build those jobs up and then look for the next move. And in that case, you build up St. Mary's and it opened up the doors to come back home to the University of Oregon. Well, you became involved with the NABC and obviously you had worked for Jim Haney uh, and 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 he, he was the longtime executive director there, will be retiring this year. W- what made you want to be part of the, the, the coaching uh, trade association? What, what, what was kind of the motivation there for you? I was at the Final Four one year, Rick, and I remember going to a BCA meeting, Black Coaches Association, and there was John Thompson, John Cheney, George Raveling, Nolan Richardson, and to hear those guys speak and, and really seeing very well-educated Black coaches that had had tremendous success and talk about what they had gone through to get there, they put a strong urgency to get involved, either through the BCA at the time, NABC, get on some of these committees, get involved so you have a, a voice and you have influence in any way. So it was early on that I knew I needed to get involved and have an opportunity to hopefully help shape the game and give back to the game, which led me to the to the NABC. 
and and I I was on one of the committees uh, with Roy Williams's athletic director at Kansas at the time, and, I, and that was way back in, boy, I want to say 1987, 88, 89, around in there. And I remember his AD telling Roy, this guy has done a really good job. Roy then introduced me to the NABC board and recommended me to become a member, and I, as I was a member for 20 plus years. Well, I, I want to talk a little bit about where we are today. This has been a really, this is this pandemic. I've always said, you know, that sport doesn't doesn't build character. Maybe it just reveals it. And and this pandemic has revealed a lot of a lot of hurt in America. A lot of a lot of bad in America. You know, this this last night we had more riots in Chicago. Um, we're still <clears throat> navigating through the the Black Lives Matter police uh, issues, uh, people on the edge. And at the same time, last night, uh, it looked like the Big Ten was about to vote the presidents not to play college football. And lo and behold, last night, about 150 uh, student athletes from around the country, football players, have now organized themselves saying, uh, hashtag, we want to play. Um, And so it's really a dynamic time in that I think we now realize that student athletes need to have maybe a bigger voice. And clearly, you know, at the Division I level in football and basketball, the disproportionate number of athletes we have are African Americans. Mm-hmm. And 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 so we're at a really interesting position. Let let let's talk a little bit about the times and, and give me some context. You know, I have I have such, you know, A, I always consider you my brother. And I have great admiration for your compassion, but also for your ability to kind of see things maybe more clearly than other people do. What what, what do you think needs to happen? Because we, whatever we're doing right now ain't working. <laughs> well, first of all, Rick, you know, I, I sympathize with, with our movement that we're in right now because it's difficult for people to understand unless you walked in the shoes <clears throat> Of, of a black person and I'll go back to being uh, picked up as an eight, nine year old and put in the back of a police car, walking through the park, me and my friend and driving us around the park and opening up the door and having a white lady look in the door and say, no, it wasn't them. And then this police officer bringing these nine year olds home and driving up in the driveway and what that experience felt like, because it was very fearful looking at these big officers with their guns and all of those things at that age. And then you fast forward. And, and as a as a student athlete uh, at the University of Oregon, here we are supposed to be celebrities. And in the middle of the day, you get pulled over at, at, at like one o'clock in the afternoon and you're looking through your rearview window and there's a policeman 40 yards behind you with this door open with a gun pointed at your head down on one knee and finding out again that they get to the car and recognize who you are and we have the wrong people, but the fear of that, and you just keep moving on as a coach at the University of Oregon with my 85 year old mom in the car, uh, my sister and her three year old son, my, my nephew in the car, again, in the middle of the daytime, getting pulled over by an officer walking to the car with a gun drawn and wanted to know, have you been drinking? <laughs> yes, with my 85-year-old mom in the car and my three-year-old and that, sure. And as the head coach of the University of Oregon, and then recognizing again who you were and then apologizing. Well, the apologies are great, but you instantly go to, well, what if you were not who you were? And what would that look like? You, you grow up with a fear, and you grow up feeling like, treated differently, sitting at the dinner of those corporate America families in Eugene and his, listening to their daughters talking about, we get pulled over, we bat our eyes, we cry, and the officer lets us go, we don't get a ticket. It's almost like a game for them where it's a fear factor for us to have to do that. And even today at age 65 years old, I see a policeman, there's fear that comes in a little bit, even if they're going the other direction, and certainly if you're going to get pulled over by one. You know, it's so fast, that's it, interesting. It, it, I, I was raised by a police officer. I mean, my dad was a city of Atlanta police officer that later became a became a federal investigator and, and as a white man growing up in the South, I always saw it the other way. You know, I saw I saw yep. the police not fearfully, but as my friend and someone that would 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 would, you know, change things. We we have a here in South Carolina, we have we have a black United States senator, Tim Scott. And he says on numerous times 
at the United States Senate. Somebody said, I didn't see your ID. I mean, the guy's mm-hmm. a, a senator. Yeah. You know, he's like, well, why don't you ask for the white guy's ID, you know, that's with me right now. So, I mean, it is a, a an amazing, it is, it is a total double standard. I mean, it, it's a double standard and there are some wonderful because I have some police officers that are friends, too. So don't you can't lump everybody into the group in, in anything you're looking at, any group of people, anything else, because there are some wonderful policemen that are out there. But you you do have that stigma for us that that's that's out there that you have to deal with and, and everything. So, you know, unfortunately, with all of this, when 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 George Floyd, the pandemic, you did have this kind of perfect opportunity storm being a big negative thing that, that woke up. Everybody just kind of woke up their eyes and everybody started looking at us and my goodness. And one of the things I tried to do, Rick, a few months back when they were protesting in Portland, I put on my mask and went out one night with my son. He says, dad, would you come march with us? And I stayed on the peripheral and, and just to observe more so than anything else. And I'll tell you, Portland is predominantly white, but yet still there's a pretty good black population there. But 95% of about 5,000 marchers were all white, young, nobody my age, and it was peaceful. They were compassionate. They approached and wanted to know if you needed water, you're okay. But more importantly, as a black man, seeing that and seeing them carry Black Lives Matters and, and all of those things, it was a very powerful moment because there were, there was, you could feel a, a spiritual movement amongst them that was moving that this is, a, this is different than any other time that was going on in this country. And I was glad I had an opportunity to do that. And I immediately started talking to coaches around the country. Do you need to get ready? Because coming back to your campuses are athletes that are intelligent, even more educated, they're activists, they understand it, they are going to challenge you, their voices are going to be heard, they're going to be strong, they're going to be demanding, and you cannot come back and treat them with the same old win one for the Gipper speech. It is not working anymore. You have got to be transparent, vulnerable, and real with these student athletes. And that's athletic director friends I've talked to as well. Well, I know know, know you changed your way of coaching at one point i mean you, you're coached by dick harder so you're coached by a marine you probably were that kind of hard ass you know we're going to do it my way or trailways kind of guy and, and and then you had to adapt at some point i think we're at another point of adaptation i totally agree uh, because i think a lot of us older coaches grew up with that mentality uh when the when the going gets tough the tough gets going you don't cry you're tougher and all that we have a different mentality being raised by our dads being at age 65, well, you're dealing with young people that are coming out of environments where there's more compassion, that they're, they're raised by single parents, a lot are raised by, are, by women, strong women, and you've got to have the ability to relate. To me, the biggest thing in coaching has nothing to do with X's and O's in this day and age. It's about relationships and your ability to relate to young people and hear young people as well too so my coaching had to change to survive it to go from this tough my way or the highway basketball coach to to as a man have the ability to put your arm around another man hug another man be compassionate with another man understand them and relate to them to give them the opportunity again to grow and be successful which ultimately led to your success well, in a lot of ways, I, I think coaches today, especially with the black athlete, not only are they coach, but they may be the first male figure that they've seen um, that has had success. Um, and, and that's a different re- level of responsibility, isn't it? It is, and it works, it works both ways because I've had a lot of players say, you have been the first uh, male black male authoritative figure in my life and yet in some cases there could be anger because they've not had that figure in their life father figure in their life and in other cases there's a yearning to attach to you to lead and show so uh, i've always tried to encourage young people that i've coached to look at the broader picture of corporate america and how to handle yourself how to dress how to talk how to articulate how how to how to go out to a restaurant and order your food and how to give an interview and all those things try to try to structure them that way because you and I both know 
that percentage that's going to go into the NBA and all that is very, very, very small. So you bet as you as you took on these responsibilities, under the hat of coach, you were the mom, the dad, the brother, the counselor, the disciplinarian, the friend. You wore all those multitude of hats, but you were called a coach. And if you don't have the ability in this day and age to relate to young people, you are not going to be successful, particularly with what's coming back to our campuses now. What do you think about the players um, <clears throat> now saying they want a voice? They want a collective voice. Is it about time? I, I am extremely happy uh, because it is about time, and, and it really is. Uh, this country has gone through so much, and athletics have gone through so much, and, and all of us as, as coaches have really uh, reaped the, the, the benefits and, and fruits of, of great contracts, opportunities, all those things. And then here are these student athletes uh, that perform for us. And a lot, again, that they don't go on to an NBA career, NFL career, and, and yet coaches are still there and bringing in that next group of athletes. So I, I'm glad that they're recognizing the voice that they have and the power they have in unity and the fact that they, you know, this is that generation, Rick, that we talked about entitlement and boy, this is the generation that's going to run our country, and what are we going to do? A lot of people are worried about our young people. Well, I don't think they have to be worried anymore. <laughs> because this, this group is saying it's our turn, it's our time. And they are showing you their ability to organize through social media, have a stronger voice, have an understanding, have a power to what's going on. It's pretty impressive to to, and me, to, to me as to what they've been able to accomplish and how they're starting to move the needle in college athletics. You know, I, I said on the show earlier today that I guess maybe <clears throat> one of my proudest accomplishments is that neither of my children have any racial bias at all. I got, I got two kids that are totally colorblind, and I mm -hmm. think we have a generation, and maybe – Maybe the tide's turned, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe this generation it, it has figured it out the right way. Um, you know, Dr. King said we want to judge somebody by the, not by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. And, 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 and maybe we're to that point now, but I still, there's still a lot of hurt out there. Well, you, you know, what, you know, why why have we not done better? I mean, it's it, it's been you know, I just don't I don't, I don't know for all of us. What do you, what do you think? Why, what can both sides do um, so that we see all of us as children of God and not black and white? What 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 do we got to do differently? You know, Rick. Um, to me, again, athletics is a it's a great showroom for how you come together uh, for one cause. And, and you could have um, two people from two totally different environments that, that come together in, in a stadium or in an arena and bond together, uh, have a beer, high five, hug after a game as they cheer for their team to beat the other team. Well, those same two people now today are looking at each other completely differently just because of what's going on in our country. So to me, uh, you've got to have compassion for each other. You've got to have compassion for your fellow man. And I don't care from what background that they're from, because if this, in my opinion, if this country doesn't figure out how to come together, you know, it, we're headed, we're, we're headed for darker days even yet, I think. And, and that can only happen when, when one can, um, uh, sacrifice, uh, humble themselves, uh, realize they do not have all the answers. Uh, as coaches, realize you got athletes coming back that have a, a stronger voice and, and are more educated on, on what does Black Lives Matter than you, so you're going to have to take a back seat and, and, and be quiet and listen and be led. Uh, all of those things, all those intangibles that, that, that build the team, that bring them together, you really need to experience those things out in our society today of, of people coming together regardless of the color of their skin they, they come together and they love each other hug each other become brothers become sisters as they move forward with their team to be successful well the united states needs to be a team <laughs> right now and, and really figure out how to come together through all of this as a as opposed to this 
all this hatred is, is reared its head again. Not going away. It's just reared its head again. But at this point in time, you've got to figure out a way to come together and, and, and let everybody be heard and let everybody have an opportunity as you move forward to be successful. You know, I've always believed that a person that is so convinced they're right to a point they won't listen to somebody else's opinion probably really doubts whether they're right or not. <laughs> you know, it's uh, I, I think it takes a big person to just try to look at the other person's perspective. I, I agree with that. I, I think, um, you know, sometimes we go through certain situations and we can get locked into a mode that really propels you to be successful or it can propel you to fail too. But where we're at in this country today, I don't care how right you think you are or, or you have to have the ability to step back and look at things from a different perspective. Get, and, and with COVID-19 and, and with our unemployment rates, uh, we're at a very vulnerable time for creative thinking, new ways of doing things. And as you know, change is difficult because it's uncomfortable. But it's that same uncomfortability you need to feel to create the change to stimulate society to be successful. You have to go through it. You can't fear the change and fear doing things differently. And there's a lot of people that fear, fear they'll lose this, fear they'll lose that, fear that you've got to feel uncomfortable. Hence, hence the uncomfortable conversations to listen, to learn about another, to see it from a different way have those conversations and they don't have to turn into conversations where you walk away from a table or an environment angry and hating each other. You can walk away educated more. You may, and maybe it doesn't change your opinion, but at least you've listened and, and maybe you've given something that the other person changes a little, or maybe you do change a little, but you have to be willing to do that. You've been, um, you've been such an influence on so many young people, um, you, you've, you've, you know, you've coached for all the right reasons. Um, you, you've tried to, to show them that there's a, there's a different way. There, there's a, there's a way, um, not, not necessarily a way out, but there's a way up. There's a way to, to break cycles and to do a lot of things. Um, at 65, what do you, what do you want to do next? What, 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 what where's your heart? I think for me, Right now, it's the opportunity to continue to give back, direct, um, help those that are that are trying to figure out their lives, and not only just in athletics. Uh, I just think their lives in general. I think, uh, particularly with us us men, who we go through so much, and through our fathers and their fathers, and we come through life with the frame of mind of of really not knowing who we are. And it takes a lot. I, I look back on my life and I didn't become a, what I would call a man until about age 40 or 45 when I could really understand, look in the mirror and say, who am I? And really be able to ask that question. And when you look at, I don't care if it's athletics, corporate America, you could be a doctor, lawyer. We all at some point in time put on those masks at very early ages, the mask we need to play the game to be successful, the game within the game. And we end up being that character in a sense. And then when you get off that stage, you're home from the operating room after 30 years. You're off the coaching stage after 30 something years. You're no longer a lawyer. And you really start to question, well, who are you? Because now the mask, you don't need it anymore. And you become this person that you don't know quite know what to do. So that transitional piece that they go through, I am really interested in helping men get through that piece. That's a big thing of, let me help you understand as an athlete, even you have all the tools to be successful. You're part of a team. You know how to grind. You're disciplined. You've got great work ethic. You've been in that arena. You can handle the pressure of the bright lights, all of that. Well, that's corporate America. You just need to figure out how to take all of that energy and move it into a career now that you can look at and say, boy, this really isn't work because I really love what I'm doing. You are going to be successful. Again, put yourself in a healthy, successful environment with that skill set you are going to be successful. But but athletes lose that. When the bright lights are over, they get lost. They get stuck because they haven't, they don't understand and coaches don't understand how to move them now from a, a former student athlete 
to corporate and how to be successful that way. So I'm really big on helping to influence that transitional period from the bright lights to the real world and how you do, how you handle yourself to be successful. And, and again, it could be an athlete or it could be somebody, a coach or a doctor on the other end coming home to retirement. Well, you're not going to come home and dominate your household like you dominated the operating room. That's not going to happen. So you're going to have to make it a big adjustment emotionally to deal with this new environment. And I'm big in helping men deal with that. Well, I, I'm a big fan of what you've done with your two boys. I mean, I, 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 you know, I know you're really, really proud of them, but I'm really proud of you for giving them a roadmap to be successful. Um, and, and, and again, you know, they're fortunate to have a dad in their life, you know, and we don't necessarily have that with, with a lot of other African-American kids. And I, so I think this challenge of coaches of saying, look, you know, candidly, when their eligibility is up, you're really just getting started <laughs> in, in, in terms of what their legacy is going to be as a human being. You know, I, I agree with that. And I don't, I think in this day and age, so it's not just African-American. I think you have a lot of households that you are getting young people that have come in that, that there's dysfunction. They, they don't have a dad or, or something has been missing in their life and that and they all go through that. And they've depended on, again, wearing that mask to be this athlete and, and usually at the collegiate level, they all were superstars in high school. So they, they all have that mentality of me, 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 and this is, and all of a sudden you, you take that away after three or four years of college and you're not going on any further and that is taken out of your life. That is a huge, huge adjustment because really is now your life is really starting now because you've been told where to go, where to be, when to be there all these years to all of a sudden, boom, you're on your own and athletes get lost. They get lost. They get lost in transition as I call it. Well, I think a lot of human beings get lost and we need to bring them back um, in a way. That, but I think knowing yourself, like you said, removing the mask, even though a moment of levity, would you believe in our lifetime that you and I could walk into a bank wearing a mask? <laughs> <laughs> I still feel uncomfortable with that one. <laughs> and, and, I, and, Rick, and this, is, this is funny, but true, because I can count again uh, – I can tell you about the number of times I've walked into a store, a Walgreens or Safeway, particularly the smaller stores, and you are followed around the store. Again, thinking you're going to steal something because you're a black man coming in. Now you're coming in with the mask on. There's an uncomfortability for me walking into a store with the mask on thinking, oh, my goodness, what are they going to think? Are they going to call the police? Because that, that you instantly go to that. And I'm yet to get comfortable going in and out of stores and restaurants with the mask on, although I do it. Because we all need to do it, and, but it, it's still a, it's yeah. a big. You, you hit it right on the head. It's a big change in our country today. Yeah, it really is, and that's and that, and I think that kind of sums up what we talked about today. I think for people listening is until you realize what the other person has gone through, and what they continue to go through, we're not going to have transformational change. Um. And and that that goes back to the word empathy. Until you have, until you understand the other person's perspective and what they have to deal with on an ongoing basis, um, you know, it's it, it, things are not going to change. Uh, but I, but I'm I, I, what I, one of the things I love about you is even with everything that's going on, you're an optimist. I mean, you're you, you've always been a, ha a glass half full guy, uh, and even in these times, I think you still see that there's a, there's a way forward. I'm that way, Rick, because here's a, a poor kid that came from Rockford, Illinois, one of 10 parents, eighth grade and sixth grade educations. And, and you've had a chance to travel the world uh, several times and have an impact on people and have people impact you. And I look at it from perspective, this is still, this is still a great country if we can come together and right our ship. It, it is, which is the reason so many people are trying to get into the United States, having traveled abroad and seeing so many people wanting to come here. It's a great country. We are out of whack big time right now. And it's a good thing that we are because we're getting ready to uh, go in another direction. And that, that's not bad. Change is not bad. Change is good. And it's just being able to handle the uncomfortability of the change 
as we go forward. So, yes, I'm optimistic because I see all these young people that are on fire right now and with, with their energy and their vision and their focus and they're committed to this. Uh, I, I think more people are going to get out and vote than ever. Th- those are not bad things. Those are good things. People want to have a voice and they want to be heard and they need to be heard and they need to vote. But these young people in our country today, are they're going to reshape our country. And they're coming back to your college campuses demanding take down that statue, change the name on that building, do this. And it's happening right now. You Who would have thought that would have happened, what's going on? And and the this movement that's happening right now is a very powerful movement. But it's, it's empowering young people, too, to realize they have a voice. And they no longer have to sit on the sidelines to make things change, whether it's NCAA, corporate, or this our federal government. And that's going to be very, very impactful to where this country goes and how this new country is going to be developed coming out of this COVID and everything else. Well, in these times of tough times, I like, I like the, the positive thinking. I I like the fact that you really believe there's a bottom up movement that's going to make us better. Uh, I can't thank you enough for being with us today. I can't thank you enough for the friendship that you and I have. I can't thank you enough for the lives that you have changed and the lives you're going to continue to change. And again, I want to thank you for being with us today from the bridge. I love you, my brother. Let's get back up on the soapbox. I recently listened to a three-part series on Dr. Melvin Maxwell. That's right. Dr. Melvin Maxwell is John Maxwell's father. Dr. Maxwell passed on July 4th at age 98. And so his son, John, has done a series, a three-part series on lessons my father taught me. If you want to listen to this, you can go to johnmaxwell.com. And listen to this series of how to really live in an enriched life and all the lessons that John's father taught him. But I want to talk about the first three things Dr. Maxwell taught John. And here they are. Number one, value people. When you value people, you get to know people. When you get to know people, you get to understand people. And through that understanding, you begin to relate to people. Number two, believe in people. When you believe in people, then you'll encourage people. Now, how do you know people need to be encouraged? They're breathing. Everybody that breathes needs encouragement. And step number three, finally, unconditionally love people. Wow. What if we did all that? What would the world look like? Every time I see someone living on the street, I'm reminded of something that my wife, Charlotte, once told me. She told me to remember that person was once somebody's baby boy or baby girl, and that they're still a child of God. Folks, we can do better. Let's all start today. It's now time to get back on the road with Rick. Many of you may remember a movie from a couple of years ago called The Green Book. It was a story of an African-American musician traveling with a white Italian uh, in the South during the Jim Crow era. The The Green Book was an, actually a real book that blacks uh, had access to that would tell them a place where they could spend the night, a motel or a boarding house. It would tell them that restaurants in the South that actually would serve black people. Um, One of the great places in America is Pascal's uh, Cafe in in Atlanta. Pascal's was a place that so many people uh, during the Civil Rights Movement would meet. Now, I've told you before about uh, one of my favorite restaurants in New Orleans is a place called The Upper Line. And uh, I was taken to the upper line, upper line firstly by my good friend, Jessica Harris. Uh, Jessica is probably the preeminent uh, authority on African-American cuisine um, in the world. Um, 
And her favorite restaurant in New Orleans is not the Upper Line. Her favorite restaurant in New Orleans is Dookie Chase. Dookie Chase was founded in 1941 by Dookie Chase Sr. and his wife as a sandwich shop. But in 1946, his son, Dookie Chase Jr., married Leah Chase, and she turned it into a full-service restaurant. Leah passed away last year at age 96. You can read an unbelievable story of Jessica Harris's relationship with uh, Leah Chase in the last month's issue of Southern Living Magazine. Dookie Chase was a, was a beacon for people during the Civil Rights Movement. It was a place that freedom fighters could come and have a safe meal. It was a place that leaders of the Civil Rights Movement could come during that period. But, oh, by the way, it's also a great place to eat. They're open for lunch only except for Friday nights when they have dinner. The lunch is a buffet with just literally dozens of Creole classics. Red beans and rice, stewed chicken, gumbo, poor boys, you name it. Many of you may have watched the HBO series Treme a few years ago. Well, Dookie Chase is right in the Treme district of New Orleans. It's both a piece of American history and a wonderful place to eat on the road with Rick. Okay, let's bring our show full circle today. The Green Book. There was an actor named Mahersha Ali who won the Academy Award um, in that movie. Mahersha Ali also played college basketball at St. Mary's for Ernie Kent. And as Paul Harvey used to say, now you know the rest of the story. That's it for our show today. Race is a serious topic, and the only way I know to change people is to change ourselves first. Thanks to Ernie Kent for his thoughts and to all of you for listening today. We'll be back next week with another edition of From the Bridge.